on glimpses into private politics and opportunities. My name is Sujin, and I am a partner of the Financial Services Practice Group of Deacons. We are honoured to have with us today, Mr. Ko Chia, um, who will be talking to us about private equity. Now, Ko is a veteran in the PE industry. Uh, he is a family office advisor and venture capitalist. He has over 40 years of diverse international experience in high-tech global corporations, US Asia venture capital investments, tech startup entrepreneurship and corporate management. Very impressive CV, I must say, KO. Both KO and myself are part of the MECHAM Professional Sub Services Subcommittees. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank MECHAM for supporting and organizing this webinar. Now, some of you here today uh, may already be an expert in uh, PE or private equity, but some of you here may not be familiar with this term. For those of you who are new to PE, we hope that by the end of today's webinar, you will have some basic understanding of PE and its role in our economy. Now, for those who already are familiar with PE, we hope that you will gain more insight about the industry and the opportunities that it offers, either from an investment or career perspective. Our webinar today will be divided into three main parts. First, we will look into the basic of PE. Then we will move on to discuss PE as an asset class for investment. And finally, we will look into career opportunities for those who are interested in venturing into these opportunities. Without further ado, I'll pass over to KO. Over to you, KO. Uh, thank you, Su Chin. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. First of all, I want to thank uh, May Cham and also the Professional Services uh, uh, Subcommittee to um, invite me to come share some of my thoughts uh, behind what private equity is all about. Um, as Su Chin says, it will be divided into three parts. So, and um, these are the three parts. Now on the introduction, it will be very macro level, very high level, uh, since this is quite a complex uh, industry with multiple variations. So I will just cover the uh, plain old vanilla. Uh, the second part will be more personal because in very many of, uh, uh, in the community out here, startup uh, ventures, uh, investments in private equities, your bankers, uh, your private bankers, particularly your wealth managers are beginning to ask you, hey, have you thought about private equity? So I want to just share my thoughts in that area. And third, I've often been asked about how do I get into the private equity? It's a hot area, what's, what's, what does it take? Um, here, I will share with you some of the, my thoughts behind this. Now to set the context, I just want to walk you through my background. So, because my context is not just financial asset class, it's all about, it's more broader than that. I come from uh, what I call the a philosophy of live, live out your world is your oyster, meaning that you seek opportunities wherever you are, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your job, you look at the world as a platform and then you move accordingly. Um, and uh, I've been blessed to be given that opportunity to actually been around the world in that context. So having gained 40 years of hard knocks in high-tech global corporations, high-tech startups, um, venture capital investments, and then family offices. I, I have a very broad and diverse type of background, uh, which um, as I say, I'm really blessed. I spend more time in, uh, in airplanes that, uh, and um, for most of my work life. I probably have done 35 years of uh, international travel. Um, and even the, before the days of uh, frequent flyer miles, uh, I was clocking up miles like crazy. Although I'm trained as an engineer, I very early pivoted away from pure engineering and went into the commercial sector despite the fact that a lot of my career moves, a lot of my jobs that I've done is also related to the technical field. So therefore that's the interrelation between them. Now having almost retired and I put the quotes in retirement in quotes because uh, you still continue to do something but you're not getting paid. I do a lot of mentoring, career development facilitation to 
younger people, younger entrepreneurs, uh, whoever that uh, the good old Lord brings to me. Therefore, I continue to serve the private equity industry as uh, still be involved in the Hong Kong Venture Capital Association. Um, spend quite a bit of time in uh, uh, helping educational and sit on a couple of advisory committees in the educational institutions because that's part of my passion to technology and serve my church community as a small way to get back to, to the society. My toughest life lessoning is to be a better son, sibling, spouse, dad, and granddad. That's my lifelong learning. Now let's look at what private equity is all about. And most uh, people will know, know a lot about the, uh, this, uh, what we call pyramid. When you look at the different financial instruments out there, your bank deposits, your bonds, your long only funds, which are mutual funds and public equities, which you buy stocks and shares. There is a class that's often misunderstood nor talked about very much. And most of, your, uh, most of you who are out there will probably investing in bonds, long only funds, public equities. This class is called the alternative asset class. Now, under alternative assets, there are actually four separate uh, asset class to private equity is one of them, hedge funds, real estate, and commodities. Many of you own properties, so you are already in the real estate area. So, so that's one. Now, when you look at the way we look at why, uh, how to uh, do risk adjusted and risk return, um, my left hand side, there's a, a arrow that says from low risk to high risk. The only reason why alternative asset class is a high risk environment is that it's illiquid. Very similar to your property. If you want to sell your property, want to cash out quickly, sorry, it takes time. Now in Hong Kong, it's a lot easier, but in a, a lot of other places, it takes time. Same in uh, private equity and all the other ones. Now, private equity is actually essentially an asset class that invests in privately held companies, meaning the, the companies are not listed yet. They are still much younger and they are still uh, being uh, building it up. So, so, and that's a very different category of uh, asset class of investing people look at. Now, most people talk about private equity as a financial asset class, and indeed it is. But if you look closely and how private equity actually serves different purposes for different organizations, it's quite an interesting uh, diversity. For instance, as a corporation, um, why do you use private equity and venture capital as a way of uh, 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 running your corporation? Companies like Intel, which is really early on, was one of the first companies in the tech sector that started a Intel Capital as an in-house investment platform where they go out and source and look at all the different new technologies out there. Interesting, they were one of the pioneers. Subsequently, a lot of the tech companies in, in, in the US well, with IBM uh, and so on and so forth, everyone was starting to use that as a platform to look at the next generation of technology where they can they don't have time in-house while they're running the company to look at those. So they set up this little unit called the, the IBM Ventures or the Intel Capital to do this kind of work so that they can scan the global environment, look at the next wave of technology that's out there that at some point in time, they either acquire in-house or they will do uh, 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 become their customers. So that's a very interesting model, which then proliferated into the pharmaceutical industries. And the pharmaceutical was, uh, was taking a different uh, approach. In the past, probably 30 years ago, the pharmaceutical industries, each corporation will have their own in-house uh, research and development, developing the next drugs. However, over time, it costs a lot of money because a drug development takes three, five, 10 years or 20 years. Therefore, 
in the as a result of that, they then decided that some of this got to be cut down and some of this uh, got to be streamlined. Resulting from that is the pharmaceutical went through a very tough time because there was not enough drug in the pipeline for their next uh, business. But however, a lot of the people that left those units went out and started their own little companies, which then were funded by venture capital. Then they says, oh, oh maybe then I should set up a farm, uh, my own uh, venture capital and scan out the environment, look at which are the ones that are out there interesting, invest and co-invest. And then as the drugs become matured, either in the clinical one, phase one, or phase two, or phase three, they bring it in house. Or they partner with those drug uh, emerging companies and then bring it in uh, to be their distribution channels. Case in point, if you look at BioNTech as, a, uh, as your vaccine today, BioNTech is actually a very small company in Germany, but we only know Pfizer BioNTech. Pfizer was the distribution channel and they acquired the rights to do that for uh, BioNTech. So that's a classic example out there today. Moving on, that whole phenomenon have actually impinged into the, even the consumer the Nordstrom of the world, the Walmarts of the world have set up their own venture because they see the consumer side of things are changing. And therefore there are new companies out there in the consumer sector doing the very similar thing. Now back in Asia, in places like China, you have a Tencent capital, you have Alibaba capital. They jumped on the bandwagon so quickly that people don't even notice it was so seamless. And therefore you have seen and capital uh, and financial came out of the, the, the original investment on their, uh, uh, their, their venture side. Tencent have a whole bunch of different companies that come through that too. So that created a whole ecosystem where you, if you are working for a corporate, one of your possibility is to come out to outside the company, start your own shop, be, um, get what I call the private equity guys or the venture guys come alongside, and then at the same, uh, same point, some point in time, bring it back to the, the, the mothership and become part of their customers or part of their units. What about universities? For universities, it's part of a process of which you can commercialize the technology that is sitting in your, um, in the entire intellectual property. Very often uh, in the past, when research are done, they write a few papers and they're put on the shelf. The commercialization of this is very, very difficult. Therefore, to be able to partner with venture capital and private equity groups, they now be able to take it to the next step and visualize and um, uh, fulfill the dreams of those people that created that technology, created those research and see the, the light of day out of it. From a family business, same, same issues. A lot of the family business in the next generation, guess what? The next generation not interested to run Papa's business. But yet Papa is getting old. And if Papa is getting old, he wants to take this business and maybe two things. One is to say, I want to translate to give it to my, uh, 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 my senior management but the senior management don't have the capital to do that. So they partner with uh, private equity groups and say, come alongside and then buy out the, the, the founder and the founder can retire or become an advisor and then, uh, 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 but yet see the fruits of it to be the company to take it to the next level. Similarly, if you have a company that says, hey, I need to go global. I don't know how. I don't have the expertise. Then you can come alongside a private equity group, which has a global footprint that they can take you on a global platform. So you have multiple choices of that uh, in that context, which then lead me to entrepreneurs. I alluded to early on, on corporate entrepreneurs, on university research profile, uh, uh, people, as well as truly entrepreneurs that says, hey, I want to do something and how do I do it? 
that's where the venture capital will comes in and walk alongside them to build and fulfill their dream. It's a whole, and that's where the startup euphoria comes about from that entrepreneurship. And there's a lot of talk about both at colleges, universities, and in the community itself, uh, everybody's talking about it. From a government perspective, it's very interesting. If you look at the historical perspective, is Silicon Valley 50 years ago, or maybe in the 50s, if you look at the whole of Silicon Valley, it was orchard fields. What fueled that entire development? It was not just entrepreneurs, but also the venture capital that came alongside and built Silicon Valley to what it is today. Closer home, when you look at in Asia, which was the first country that actually embarked onto this uh, uh, strategy? It was Taiwan. In the 70s, one of the ministers, uh, the late uh, Minister Lee, actually suggested and actually pushed through very hardly, bringing venture capital phenomenon, bringing entrepreneurs back from the US that, or, or executives that are working for multinationals coming back to Taiwan to start a technology hub. As a result, you got Sinju that came about resulting from that. And then it has evolved into the PC manufacturing, computer manufacturing, and create a whole ecosystem around it, therefore becoming an entire uh, a new generations of industries and economic development, creating employment. That's where government can play a strategic role in that process. So as you can see, venture capital, private equity, is not just a financial asset class. And a lot of people miss out that point when they just purely talk about a financial asset class as a high risk game. Yes, it is high risk, but yet at the same time, if applied appropriately, it is creating wealth, creating employment, creating economic development, creating the next generation of businesses in every country. Resulting from that success in Taiwan, I see that in Korea, I see that in Israel, people are jumping on the bandwagon. All a lot of the countries, Singapore, Malaysia, all these other countries are beginning to look at this whole phenomenon of venture capital. China, of course, have gone uh, way ahead of everybody else. And today you see a very vibrant uh, venture capital, uh, private equity uh, industry there, as well as a very interesting uh, ecosystem of next generation of companies that are coming out. Alibaba, Tencent never existed 20 years ago. Today, it's a major force, a major employer. To me, this is significant. Now, there is a lot of confusion about what private equity is. Private equity is the generic name, but underneath it is actually several different sectors and subsectors in each of those. In fact, the way to describe it is it's actually very simple. If you follow a life cycle of a company, that's where you are starting. When you're starting out, two, two guys and a, 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 an idea, you are an early game, you're doing a startup. And the people that seed you are the angel investors. But as you move along, you need to bring in some institutional investments. And that's the venture capital, which is in early stage development, early stage uh, investments into a company where they help you shape the strategy, shape the direction, shape the, uh, the position of the company moving forward. That's venture capital. And that's also happens to be the highest return if done right and the highest risk. Because in a venture capital fund, to be honest, if you have uh, two or three, if you have 10 companies, if two or three uh, die, zero return, uh, completely uh, burnout, out, it's very normal. But if you have one or two companies that have 10x return, meaning you put in $1, you get $10 back. You already have a, a, a very successful uh, a venture capital fund. And it's that bifurcation of high 
a couple of very high success, but a lot of failures within the fund. That, to run that, to be in that, really requires a strong stomach. In the next category, where you have some business, where you have some customers, you need, a, you need a more capital to grow this company. And that's usually called the expansion of growth capital. So when people talk about, in generically talks about private equity, they actually talk about really the expansion and growth type of companies. But venture capital is a very different animal. Well, when the expansion and growth capital is very much like looking at the financing, looking at the financial engineering, and, and how to build the company out, uh, not just in a geographically, but also expand the product line, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. Earlier slide, I also talked about a buyout because when you have a family business and you want to sell it to a, a, a third party or sell it to your senior management, you're actually doing a buyout. You're buying out the original owners to a new owner. But because you don't have the capital, you bring alongside a private equity group to help you ride that along. But those are usually larger companies. Another phenomenon is uh, also when you have a corporation that you have, uh, you decide to change a strategy, but you have business units that are no longer uh, the, the, in alignment with the same, uh, the, the, the new strategy. So those business units may be very profitable, but they do not uh, fit the new strategy. Therefore, you can uh, do a buyout and sell those companies either to the management or to third party uh, investors that where they can now take the companies or the products to the next level. Another phenomenon is when you have a company in distress where you really need capital, stressed out, like during pandemic where you have cash flows issues, but your business is fundamental solid. Working with a private equity group will help to inject more capital into it and turn that business around. So that's how this whole industry works. It is not one sector, it is many subsectors. And there's some more ways to skin the game. And very often you see in a, a company, you have venture capital groups in it, in the early game. And then later stage, you have the private equity groups that comes alongside to build the company to the next level. So, but as you move along this uh, 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 table, it becomes lower and lower risk. Obviously, when the company have lower, uh, have uh, a business, a turnover, have profit, it's a much lower risk than the early stage venture game. Now, private equity is actually a very simple uh, thinking. The cycle is very simple. You raise some funds, you invest, you monitor the, the, the portfolio you have, and then you get out. And then you do the cycle again. It sounds easy. And therefore, in the very many universities and colleges, they're trying to teach private equity. It's a daunting task because this is almost like a no-brainer. There is no theory in it. The only theory that you can, they, they can talk about is valuation. But the trick is in how you invest, how you select the type of companies, how you work alongside those companies through when you were monitoring it to make sure that it goes through the ups and downs of market cycles before it gets pops up. Let me tell you, very often a company looks terrible today, but tomorrow, it can be very good. But it's to ride through those ups and down cycles that will see you through. How then you pivot that your current product may not fit the market, like very similar that during this pandemic, a lot of companies got to pivot to a new phenomenon. Unless you're fast enough to pivot or agile enough to pivot along with your investors that can have the experience to work what we will, your history. So the cycle is not difficult, but the execution is the critical. Okay, oh, can now I just stop you? Sure. Oh, sorry, just, just to stop you there. I, I know that you explained in the previous uh, 
slide where you talk about the cycle and you say that the most difficult part is you know making the investment. But I guess it depends on from which aspect you're looking from. I mean, of course, if you're already in the BE and you're making investments, because for example, we have for a lot of fund managers, I think one of the uh, key concerns they have, or difficulty or challenges they have in this current environment is not only at the investment part, but more on raising capital, which obviously you're going to talk about later on as, you know, this is one of the asset class that, you know, people can invest in. But, you know, to be able to raise capital and to be able to convince people that, you know, they're giving you the money to invest and you are good at picking, you know, the underlying investments. Do you think that is more challenging than actually deciding which company to invest in? I think it's each each of those uh, stage has its own different uh, challenges. Someone that is very good in investing may not be very good in fundraising. Someone that is good in investing, hopefully, can be good in monitoring too. So within a category of your own organization you really have different skill sets that come alongside. Fundraising in itself is a skill. And in fact, the best fund managers actually continuously raise funds. They don't wait till the time where they totally out of funds before they invest. They talk to institution uh, managers, they talk to institutional investors way ahead of the game. They have a whole strategy in their pipeline. I still remember when I was uh, in a private equity, when I was a venture capital private equity person, we used to be constantly fundraising. Not that we need to trigger the, the fundraising, but we constantly talk to investors or potential investors, current investors, that you says, hey, we're thinking about this. What do you think? We're thinking about raising a fund in the next year. Uh, so your existing investors say, ah, they're raising the next fund in the next year. I, I, I like these guys, I better allocate some resources or a allocation for them. You don't just go into them and say, oh, dude, by the way, next month I'm running out of capital. No, 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 you don't do that. If you do that, they say, sorry, come back next uh, uh, two years later. Then you're stuck. So it is a specialty in its own rights. And, and you got to be very, very cognizant of that. And very many fund managers, uh, especially first time fund managers that I've met, it's very interesting because they're very good investors, but they've never done fundraising. They've never done the sales pitch. So when they talk about the, uh, the, the strategy, it's very convoluted. You gotta be very crystal clear because the institution investors will look at you and say, can I make money out of these guys? Very simple. If I have a doubt, they walk because they have so many choices. And every sales pitch, it's a good pitch. There's no sales pitch I've seen is a bad one, but to be able to peel off which are the good ones, which are the not so good ones, is also another skill. So there's a lot of nuances, subtleties in this whole process. And it's all about execution of how you do it. And some people are better than others. Uh, also, private equity industries, uh, this is my humble view, is that it's the only industries that is now left in the financial asset class that is still a mentor, mentee. That if you have a good mentor right at the beginning, you set your path right and they can map out your, your whole career in that context. Because every stage of the game, you started in, in, in an organization, in a venture fund, what you do is you do number crunching. You do research work. You do financial modeling. But as you go into investing, you follow your seniors and look at why they invest in that, why they think that deal is better. And then as you do in the monitoring, I always, uh, being a partner level, what I do is always bring on one of my juniors with me at my board meetings. I say, I'm going to commit things, but you're going to action it. So in that process, they are looking at you and you're training them and you're giving them thoughts that says, this is how you monitor, this is how you tackle the issues uh, along the way. And when there's a pandemic, for instance, like this point in time, panic. Unfortunately, out there, a lot of the fund managers, the earlier, uh, the, 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 the younger fund managers have never seen a cycle. For crazy people like us, they've seen several cycles up and down 
you don't see the surprises anymore. It's just another cycle. So you're more stable. You can kind of like sit back and look at where are the issues that will impact you the most. So that's a whole gamut that, uh, that we go through. And in fact, in the Venture Capital Association, we, we actually do a whole course on, on all this, the whole cycle. And I'm actually one of the faculty members as well. Now, if you drill inside, uh, I'm gonna use a couple of terminologies that uh, people may not be familiar with. Now, and in every venture capital or private equity fund, it has an investment strategy. Geographically, why they're doing that, why they differentiate from the next guy, and they're not equal. Their background, and, um, and also what they're trying to do. Now, two things. Two, two terminologies. Uh, the fund manager is usually called a GP. The investors that are coming into the fund is called an LP, limited partners and general partners. Now notice in the private equity fund world that the GPs have put in their own cash, committing to the fund. And this is one of the very, very few industries that I see has skin in the game. You go look at a long only fund, they don't have skin in the game. They are just uh, an employee of the fund. But in the private equity world, if you are a GP, sorry, you got to cough out your own capital. But the fund life is long, seven to 10 years. Seven years usually for more uh, later stage game uh, or some of the real estate funds but normally it's 10 years. So you're locked up for at least 10 years. So it is a long-term commitment. And the minimum requirement of minimum amount putting into the fund is 1%. But most institutional LPs will demand greater than one. Now imagine that you have a, a $100 million fund you're going to cough up a million dollars, your GPs, the fund managers. Now, not many people have that amount of money. Now, if you increase the size of your funds, it progressively goes up. So it is not a short-term game. This is not a short-term game thing. This is a long event. It's a long thing. And you've got to be able to sustain and persevere throughout. And not, it is not for the person who is thinking very short term. Now, in the context of a private equity fund, you then take the capital and invest in different companies, portfolio company A, B, and C, and so forth. And that's how you, different, uh, you, you, you have the different, to mitigate the risk, that you don't put all your money in one company. You mitigate the risk by saying, I have a portfolio set of companies underneath. So even if one doesn't make it, I have others that uh, have the potential to making it. So the role of the investors is really more of a passive role. The GP is the active manager that manages the whole portfolio, identifying the whole cycle, identifying the investments, monitoring and exiting it. So, but there is also a management fee involved in the private equity fund. The management fee usually uh, between one to two and a half percent of fund size. So let's say if it's a hundred million dollar fund, uh, two two percent uh, management fee, you get two million dollars. Now the whole idea is the two million dollars is not for you to make money out of the two million dollars as a management fee. It's for you to build the team, travel, and any of of the operating expenses for the fund managers. Your whole you make money when you exit your portfolio companies, when you make money from your underlying portfolios. And therefore the concept of carry interest where you split the, uh, the, the profits between you and the investors. And in normal circumstances, most uh, in institution investors will want that if you have a hundred million dollar fund, I want you to return all hundred million dollars before the 101 million, then you can split the difference. 
where 80% goes to the investors and 20% goes to the, uh, the, the investment manager. If you do a good job, your CI will be phenomenal. And that more than compensates the management fee and all the other else. That's why when a lot of people say, oh, venture capitalists, they're very rich. They're very rich because they make money from their investments, not only on their percentage that they put in, but also on their carry interest that they uh, distributed them. But it's a, not a short-term game. It is a 10, 20, 15, 20 years game. So that's the, uh, that's the nature of the, the game here. Uh, if I just may add uh, a few words in terms of sure. the structures. So the one that you show on the chart is basically a typical uh, P fund structure as a limited partnership where you have a GP and limited partners. Uh, but in practice, it's also possible to structure um, a, a PE fund in the form of a corporate structure, although not mm -hmm. common, especially for global, but I think in Asia, because I think first, the investors are less sophisticated. And secondly, because the underlying investments are more straightforward. So a corporate structure is also used and is basically, it's, you know, the, the terms and all that could be similar to a limited partnership structure, but it's just that it's in the form of a corporation. And secondly, um, in the GPLP structure, you may have a GP, but let's say if you're doing an asset management in Hong Kong, uh, normally a separate entity will be appointed as a manager. And that entity, um, if performing the asset management functions in Hong Kong, most probably will need to be licensed by the SFC. So in that scenario, you'll see that in addition to the GP, you will also have a manager, which is licensed by the SFC. And I think that is a, a, a structure that we will commonly see in Hong Kong. Another point that I would like to add is that in terms of returns, in addition to you know, what KO says about carry interest and all that, and you know, investors expecting that you know, they'll be paid you know, the amount of capital they have investors, there's also a concept of preferred return, which generally will be yes. about six to 8%. So basically it means that not only uh, the investor expect that they'll get back all the capital that they have invested, they will also expect that they get a return about six to 8% percent of the capital that they have invested in before they're willing to share you know the gain with you so you have to achieve a hundred percent recovery of the invested capital a six to eight percent return to your investors then only you may be entitled to the carry interest of you know 20 percent but of course you know at the end of the day if you are very successful and you know all your deals are you know you're as able to exit at very high valuations then that 20% is very significant. But unfortunately, the downside is that, you know, if you don't manage, you know, to generate sufficient profits from your deals, so maybe what you'll be getting is only the management fee and not the carry interest. Right. Okay, I'll go back to you, Kyo. Thank you, Su Chin. You're the expert in the structures. In fact, uh, it, it added to the complexity, sometimes it's not just the preferred return, it's the compounded version, which is annual. So the longer you delay the, your, your return, if it's like 6% compounded, by the time it's five, six years, it's no longer 6%, it's 20%. <laughs> so, uh, and that's, and this game, this whole private equity game is really a race against time. Uh, so it's very ironic. It's, uh, you got to be very quickly trying to return capital, but yet at the same time, I call it the, the marathon, the patient capital. So, so it has two parts to it that is like a bit um, ironic, but that's the nature of, of the business. And uh, as a result, it's a highly, highly stressful environment um, in, in that context. The point that maybe, you know, for our audience to consider is that if you invest in the PE fund, you don't pay the investment amount upfront. So normally what happens is that you commit to invest in certain amount. Let's say, for example, you commit to amount, invest 100 million. So that's normally called a capital commitment, but you don't pay from day one. But your GP or your managers call the capital as and when they have a deal. Yes. So meaning that you may have to set aside, you know, the amount that you have committed to invest, but, you know, you mean at the end of the day, um, they may not call the entire amount. 
But if they do, you normally only have, let's say, about 10 business days to pay that amount. So it's sometimes from investors' perspective, they also have to manage their own cash flow because the amount that you know you commit to invest is actually quite substantial. And most of the time, there's no fixed amount as to how much the GP can call. So it's potentially they can call 50%. Although not, you know, not common, but they can. So you you will have to bear in mind that if you have committed to invest 100 million, then you will need to make sure that you're able to come up with that 100 million million within a short period of time. Yeah. Back to um, you. This 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 part is uh is um I, I think for private investors is um it, sometimes they get caught in that phenomenon, but uh but that's part of the nature. And, and not only that, if you are a fund manager, if you, you've got to cough up the similar amount as well um, uh, uh, accordingly. And usually the capital call is called because they have identified a, a company to invest. And that's why they're calling the capital plus the management fee together so that they can then execute the investments as appropriate. That's why they give you 10 days and it's all written out in the documents. So you cannot delay for a month. Uh, and any default is very severe uh, penalties on that as well. So, so that's another whole gamut of managing uh, investors' expectation and things like that. Now, the private equity world, um, in fact, for private equity to do well, it is not just about the capital, but the value add that the, the GPs will bring to the table. The first thing is when I always say that if I invest in a company, the first thing I'll do is restructure the corporate governance so that they can be uh, 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 more transparent to be able to deliver uh, on a transparency that is appropriate as if it's a listed company. So why do we do that? It's so that when the company has gone through that process for two or three years, after they've gone through it, they become second nature to them Therefore, when they go listing, it's smooth. However, I've seen a lot of companies that are out there that when they go listing, they got to backtrack the entire corporate governance structure back to maybe five years or 10 years, and that's really painful. Um, and then your management team is not used to doing those things. So that's, that's why going forward, you get into all kinds of issues uh, later on. But for us in private equity shops, the first thing we do is to make sure that the corporate governance is in place. Um, we also bring industry expertise. So we can tell you that if you want to expand to uh, another part of uh, the geography, we have uh, team members or other portfolio companies that are synergistic to you, that can take you there and become introduced customers or partnerships to, to help you roll it out as well. We usually have a, uh, a global roller decks. Um, my own roller decks is about 7,000 people. And I shredded 4,000 when I retired the first time. So now I built it up to another 6,000. That, those are networks that I can call upon that says, hey, for this company, I can connect them to this, this, and this so that they have, a, 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 they don't waste time to go ferret around looking for the type of uh, right partners because we already have that connectivity. Resulting from that, every private equity shop, when they look at a deal, they look at the global, global reach, global companies. How can I build this company from just a small, uh, medium-sized, uh, maybe countrywide to a regional-wide to global-wide? Uh, that's part of our strategy, part of the things that we do in value adding. We also then therefore at the appropriate time um, send them and actually provide supporting services. Like we were introduced to, if they're looking for a CFO, for instance, we're introduced to a headhunting company, which we have worked with in the past, or the tax consultant uh, that is in, 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 um, in one of the uh, big fours like EY, uh, or the appropriate uh, 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 people that we can connect the legal people, the all kinds of stuff that we, we can uh, bring to the play because we have connectivity to all these organizations that we work with. Another part is uh, very seldom talked about is the synergy with portfolio companies. Some of us, when we invest, we invest like, for instance, if we invest in a technology play, 
we may invest in another company that is in a product that could use the technology or enhance the existing product of another company. And then we also have a company that may be doing distribution. So it kind of like feed the whole supply chain uh, phenomenon. And that's something that we only internally will have a strategy to think about as a, pro, uh, as a uh, private equity fund. As a result, we serve on boards and we provide strategic directions to be able to drive the company, give advice, when is the appropriate time to do what, and which are the partners to come alongside them to do all this. So private equity group, it's almost like we are not just a, uh, Financial investors, we are also like a, a middleman that brings forth every type of services together to connect and build our portfolio companies. Here are some of the examples of uh, uh, services that uh, support our industries. Of course, investment banks, when we go in private, uh, go private uh, IPO, we usually, before a company goes uh, IPO, I will talk to my uh, friendly investment bank. I'll kind of like casually and say, hey, I have a little interesting company that I want to show to you in 12 months. We think it's ready to go out. Can you take a look at it? And most investment bankers love it because they will get the first mover advantage. Um, because the way I pick the bankers is that I like their research base, all the capital markets uh, access, and all that stuff that I already uh, suss them out. So that's why I offer them that. So because it provides the best out, outlet for my uh, portfolio company. Advisory services like capital fundraising, corporate finance, how to sell the company or acquire another company to make it uh, even a bigger play. Uh, placement agents uh, very often are used to raise capital for fund, uh, private equity funds. Obviously, service providers are favorite people, the accounting firms, the tax, the legal, the HR. Unbeknown, valuations and appraisals of uh, if they have a property, we need to use that to, to appraise it. Uh, insurance, ah, insurance is uh, usually not talked about, but for fund managers, uh, as well as for uh, serving as directors of all companies, you need your, um, <laughs> Officers and directors, uh, directors and officers uh, insurance. And that's, that's really much needed. Um, not only for yourself as a director of the company, but also for your fellow directors on that companies. And of course, financial services providers like Bloomberg. We also work with due diligence company that do uh, the reference checks on people. We actually have worked with people who have detective background to look at people's uh, private life as well, to make sure that they are the right type of people that we want to work with. And obviously our, our industry consultants on different industries uh, for environmental issues, like if they what you invest in a, uh, uh, a company that have potentially environmental issues, you better check that out. And as we move along the way, ESG experts, as companies are beginning to talk a lot more about putting ESG into their whole operating uh, approach so that as they go out onto our IPO process, all stock exchange will require ESG reporting. We also have research companies that do industrial studies, fund performance uh, for us, because we also need to ensure that when we go and deliver all these results to, to our in investors, we need to be able to measure the performance and how it stack up from the, the other people in the industry. Obviously for fund managers, for uh, us, us we're, this is a fairly significant part, fund, fund administration, people who do the capital call for us, people who manage the cash in and out uh, and, uh, 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 the capital call, the accounting services, the reporting requirements, not only just uh, for the fund itself, but also our own uh, management company that we need to running uh, our own audits and stuff like that. And obviously professional organizations like private equity associations, conference organizations, the network people together. 
um, I think we will be running out of time. Yes, I think we should yes. just move on to the second yes. topic yes. on investment opportunities. For personal investment opportunities, I will be quick. Um, now, very interesting enough that uh, before you jump into the, 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 get excited and say, hey, private equity, I'm interested, I want to jump into that. Make sure you look at your own risk profile and appetite. You really have to allocate your assets, your liquidity needs, and diversify your assets. Type of funds and deals. Remember, this is a long, long uh, close-ended deals. They are not, uh, you can get out when you need to. But there are some people also talking about, hey, maybe, maybe I can do small amount as angel to late stage pre-IPO. Yeah, you could do that too. But uh, uh, be careful of, uh, of liquidity and all the other issues that will, 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 will come about. Everything is illiquid, think about that. And uh, you got to factor it into your own investment uh, process. Now, in our private equity world, a lot of people will say, oh, IRR is good enough. But in our private equity world, to be honest, we don't just look at uh, IRR, we also look at cash on cash. Meaning if I give $1 out, how many dollars do I get back? So as to diversify your return profile, geographic stage, stage, uh, and year. Now, increasingly, your bank managers, uh, your wealth managers are coming to tell you, hey, I've got this uh, really good private equity funds. Uh, uh, you should invest. What they do is they actually take a, uh, an allocation, maybe a hundred million, and then they slice it up to very, very small slices, like $250,000 uh, US, and then they offer it to you. So you are part of a slice of a big slice. Uh, they will then go into a big fund. Now, remember, there's a fee by the banker and there's a fee by the fund manager. So you're paying double fees. So beware of that. So, but the private banks will only give you the large established and known funds. That's, that's their nature. And that's the only thing that they will know because it's the least risk for them. But however, there's an increasing trend that some of the private banks particularly uh, are offering people very thematic funds like healthcare funds, like uh, medical funds, like FinTech funds and all these other thematic ones. These are usually more of an earlier game. So beware. Bankers are also offering some uh, high net worth uh, investors pre-IPO shares and IPO shares. Some people call this private equity too. Indeed it is, but it's a quick flip. But you're not maximizing the returns on that. However, having said that, there are some people that say, hey, the IPO shares can go up by 10, 10, 10 times. Yes, true enough. It can also come down by 10 times. So as I said, it's a higher fee charge on this uh, because private banks, why are they going into this? Because they can make a lot more uh, fees on uh, their clients. So there are also people ask me, why do I, how do I source? This? I want to do some angel, uh, do some direct deals. Direct deals source through a personal network, professional network, angel network, maybe referrals, and some other co-investors that will do this kind of work for as well. But don't forget, do your due diligence as well, because not all of them are, 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 are savvy. My it's just a, a, a reminder, sure. sorry, Kayo, to cut it off there. I, I just a reminder that a lot of the PE funds, is it not a lot, that most of the PE funds are not authorized by the SFC. So they basically are not intended for retail investments. Now, of course, obviously, if you qualify as a professional investors, you know, you're high net worth individuals, um, no issue of you, you know, being offered, you know, a PE uh, deals. But just bear in mind that this is not your typical, you know, SFC all price funds that you can buy from your normal commercial banks, or you know you can buy from some of those investment platforms. So these these are not available to everyone. Sorry, yeah, back to and, you, Kale. Thank you for 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 bringing that. Professional investor is is defined as you have a, a net worth of one million US dollars minus your property. That's in Hong Kong because in Hong Kong a property can be worth a million dollars US. Um, so. My, here are some thoughts to think about if you're interested in investing in this. Allocate a small amount to this asset class, 
to kind of like get a feel of what's going on out there. Select the areas that you have passion or you understand, maybe like financial services, energy, tech, life science, whatever it may be. Start with funds because you reduce the risk because they have a lot of other portfolio companies under it. Treat it as a learning and a new trend and businesses. Dabble into direct deals, but please limit your size. And if there's any investment returns, treat it as bonus. Usually I treat it as almost like my philanthropy. So you invest in it, if it comes back, it's fine. If it doesn't, it won't hurt my pocket. So something to think about in that context. Otherwise, you'll be sorry that uh, you see, uh, there's some people who say investment means, oh, must have returned, not necessary, because this is a high risk illiquid game and it's subjected to market dynamics. Um, the next topic is really very quickly, um, potential careers in PE. Here, what I did was I dissect uh, 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 the team inside a private equity fund. You usually have three, broadly three teams, the deal team, which are the ones doing the investments and the portfolio team, the value adding team. Uh, and sometimes the deal team and the portfolio uh, operating team are the one and the same. And also the back end, the finance operations and support team. So in the deal team, usually when you come in uh, as a young analyst, then you progress to principal, to director, to partner, to MD, and then the managing partner. For portfolio operating team, you come in and add value. So for portfolio guys, you really are coming from industry with strong industry experience on running companies. Uh, you progress from either director or some people come in as venture partners and then partner and managing directors. Increasingly, there's a need for sustainability ESG specialists. On the back end, it's a lot more simple. Finance, accountants, fund admin, controller, CFO, COO. Uh, admin accounting, audits, bank relationships. You also need investors, relations officers, investment directors, investment partners. Those are focused on managing the investors uh, relationship and actually doing some of the fundraising work. But you also have IT specialists because there's so many data flowing around. You need to have IT people to be able to manage some of those and actually manage some of the outsourcing uh, 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 services too. HR, so if your fund is big enough, you bring in your own HR people to help recruit people for your underlying portfolio. Uh, and of obviously compliance and legal increasingly you need that. I put it a different way in this uh, three portfolio uh, 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 buckets. The, the, for the deal team, really you need uh, diverse discipline. It's not necessarily all finance people. You have engineers, you have uh, psychology, you have history, you have legal, all kinds of people, but usually have significant experience in, uh, in, in each of those area, possibly with an MBA and a CFA. You have to be culturally a language and financial modeling uh, 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 savviness. Uh, investment skills, of course, for due diligence and wet networking, how to deal with your network flow, how to create deals, how to source deals, and therefore, you need to be really intellectually curious about what is happening around you. For portfolio managers, you need industry experience, functional management, strategy, marketing, uh, mentor to CEO, or implement ESG and empathy and working with the senior management of the underlying portfolios. And finance, no, uh, most people know this uh, skill sets to be able to interact with LPs, portfolio regulators, and an eye for detail. So for, to be able to then move from one to the other, for someone coming in, you could either come in from either supporting services, come into a finance operations, then mitigate through the uh, portfolio management and the deal team, or you can go into a portfolio company and then come through one of those platforms. And then you can mitigate across uh, the different platforms. Private equity groups tend to hire people that they know. If you have worked with uh, 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 portfolio companies of uh, private equity funded companies, you probably know who are their founders. Get to know them. Get to know their, their investors. 
and if you were in the fund management area, you probably get to know the managing partners and uh, their team and develop those relationships. And as, it, as uh, opportunities open up, that's when they will pick people that they know already. Very rarely that they're bringing someone that is totally a stranger, except for the younger uh, analyst level. But they usually work together at some point in time. To me, this is a very exciting type of uh, uh, business. But it's, as I say, it's a marathon. You have a long-term sustained interest and, and patience. It's a sprint because the moment you put down the capital, you raise the capital, you got to raise to invest after the fund is raised. Intense hard work, long hours, particularly if you have teams across the region or across the world. As I said, you need a seasoned mentor to survive, uh, to be able to thrive well. But for personally, you need to have the, the ability to understand or withstand volatility, VOCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, and multiple market cycles. I guess being inquisitive, adaptable, some form of risk taking will give you a very stimulating career. This is kind of like the ecosystem. I uh, won't go through it. Uh, it's uh, fairly clear. Um, someone like Hong Kong have a vibrant capital market, have government support, clear legal rules, very strong professional services, uh, management talent, deal flow, and being a fund hub will become a very successful play. Here are some trends. Uh, Technology is permeating through all industries, emerging new opportunities in ESG, SDG, social impact, sustainable. There's a heightened in fact, uh, interest in this private equity world from family offices, from outside networks, younger generation. Numerous wealth managers offer PE as alternative products. I hope that this kind of gives you a little bit of uh, flavor on when you're talking to some of the, uh, your bankers, your know, wealth managers, as they're talking about private equity, you know what it is all about at least. For most, for one last point, it's actually challenging to uh, uh, access the top quartile funds financially, uh, personally, because you need to know what's going on in those groups. Uh, but for direct deals, it's really not for the faint heart. My last slide is, the literate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and we learn. Hope today I give you some new learnings and overcome some of the uh, uh, preconceived ideas that you have on the private equity and venture capital world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gail. I think you have shared your 40 years of experience in an hour. I think that's a great achievement itself. Um, I'm not sure whether our participants have any questions. I think you know well, we are running out of time, but uh, maybe we can address one or two questions if you have them. Uh, otherwise, I think feel free to reach out to myself or KO if you want to know more about PE. Yeah. Oh, Thank you for there's listening. There's only one question. That's how to reach out to the speaker. I think you can contact me, Chen. They should have our contact details. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a yeah. good day ahead. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you, Suchin. Thank you for... for Thank you. For, Bye. For, um, for adding your points, which are very valid. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed. Have a good afternoon.